is, um, you know, as, as Masuki, you know, said, you know, my background is in psychoanalysis, and I, I've, I've often really thought a lot about the relationship between psychoanalysis and the writing. And, you know, a lot of what I do in my own practice is I, I listen to my patients and I, I kind of write their stories. Um, and a lot of that involves very close listening. Um, I was wondering, you know, as a writer, how do you how do you listen to yourself? How do you how do you think about listening to the kind of story that you want to tell? Um, how do you kind of write about drama or pain? Um, and what does that look like for you? Thank you, Vasky. Thank you, Ricky. So how does one write about trauma? How does one write about about pain? Well, I think maybe regarding the word trauma gives away a lot about the secret and enigma that trauma is. Trauma in English is both, a, it's singular and it's plural. Trauma as a word refers to the Greek, the ancient Greek word wound. And one might have to wonder, where does a wound start? Where does trauma start? Does it come as a singular or as a plural? Regarding my own biography, did the trauma start with the war? I was born in Sri Lanka in 1984. The genocide against the Tamil people, engineered and executed by the singular state and the Sri Lankan army. Is that where trauma begins? Is that where trauma ends? Does trauma begin with my mother fleeing the country with me being four months old and my older brother just being one? Does trauma begin with arrival, arriving in Germany in a divided state and then having lived in seven different asylum camps? Does mm -hmm. trauma begin with the poverty we have experienced, the bitterness of poverty? Does trauma begin and end with a capitalistic society, a patriarchal society, a racist society? So I don't think that trauma comes in singular. Trauma is always a plural. But regarding trauma as a wound, we can't say where the wound begins and where the wound ends. The wound is identical to our body, but yet it is not identical to a body. It begins beyond and before our body has even begun living. And I think sometimes maybe our mouth too is a wound that we don't understand, that we have not understood what size it has. So regarding your question, Ricky, how does one write about trauma? I think we don't write about trauma. Trauma writes itself. I think that's a, that's a really interesting kind of provocation uh, about what it means to like, sort of have a llama by itself. Um, you know, one, one thing that kind of stood out for me in what you were talking about is, you know, around the mouth. And when I think about the mouth, I think about language and the question of translation. And so I have a question about translation, you know. I, you know, I, my mother tongue is Malawan, uh, and your mother tongue is Tamil, but my first language is English, and I write in English, and I, I think in English, but I also write in, in Malawan. And you write in German, and I was wondering that, how do you write and, and, and live across these different languages? Like, you know, our conversation right now is in English. Um, and so there's something about how language becomes a site of drama also, how we, there's an experience that happens when you move from one language to another, a sense of loss. And so I was wondering if you had any thoughts about the question of translation or how translation, how do you feel about translation? 
I do believe and I do agree that language itself can become a trauma. But I would say that language itself is always a trauma. The syntax, the grammar is sharp as a knife, a knife held to our throat. So regarding your question, how to navigate the question of translation, I barely speak Tamil. I have lost my ability of speaking Tamil while I was a child when I entered kindergarten. When I speak to my parents, I speak in a mixture of English because Sri Lanka has been a British crown colony for 133 years in German and in the little Tamil, the ruins of the Tamil language, I'm still able to articulate. Mm -hmm. German, as soon as I started writing, and I might have to add that I never wanted to become a writer. I have never written any poetry before. I have never written any short story or something that one could call a novel. From mm -hmm. early age on, I wanted to become either a pastor, a man of God, or a scholar. I wanted to teach the history of philosophy. So writing to me came as an accident. I was actually sitting on my PhD in philosophy. I wanted to pursue a PhD um, on Hegel's notion of tenderness and violence in his science of logic and in <clears throat> his philosophy of history. But then <clears throat> all of a sudden, and regarding or thinking back what has happened, it somehow still is a miracle to me when I started in July 2013, out of nowhere, out of nothing, out of the blue, to write what then later on became my first novel. So coming back to your question, ever since I started writing, ever since I started writing literature, it feels like the capacity and the capability of speaking in different languages, I lost them all at once. I did learn French in school, six years. I did have to study ancient Greek during my theology study and Latin. I, I assume I'm sort of uh, fluent in speaking English, but yet the German language became so dominant that I lost all words in different languages. Mm -hmm. So somehow it does not feel like translation, but it does mm -hmm. also not mean that the German language is closer to me than any other language. Mm -hmm. I yet believe that each language I speak, I have ever spoken, is in the same distance to me than German, Tamil, ancient Greek, Latin, or French. Mm -hmm. So it does not feel like translation at all. But yet, coming back to the question of the body I started talking about before, maybe the real translation is the translation of our body. Mm -hmm. In German, the German word for tr translation is übersetzen, which has a nautic metaphor. It mm -hmm. can also mean von einem Ufer zum anderen übersetzen, which can be roughly translated as moving from one shore to another. Mm -hmm. So I do believe the crucial translation is not a translation of language. The first translation and the only translation I'm living in is the translation of this body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it, it's an interesting, it's, so it's compelling about how how the body moves between different languages and how the body exists not it's just in one language but it exists in different languages at the same time. Um, but I if, I can, yeah. if I can add something to what you just said, Ricky. Mm -hmm. I think when we think about bodies, it's not merely about the flesh. It's not merely about the skin. It's not merely about the collection of random bones that our body is made of, that is basically holding this skin like a, uh, like a bag. Mm -hmm. I think that I've studied theology, as I said before, and I was raised in a rather conservative religious family. My father is Christian, my uh, mother is Hindu. So somehow, both symbols were present at the very same time. Mm -hmm. And also symbols that were contradicting each other. Just mm -hmm. let me give you a brief example. For instance, in the Christian symbolism, the snake mm -hmm. is an animal mm -hmm. of evil. Mm -hmm. but, in ta but in Hinduism, the Nagas can be holy creatures as well. Yeah. And I think both 
both the truth are valid, valid at the very same time. Mm-hmm. But then again, as I have learned speaking German through the Bible, the mm-hmm. Bible was the first book I've read, mm-hmm. and uh, it still is a reference to my literature. Mm-hmm. When we regard the, what it has been written in the Gospel of John, that mm-hmm. Jesus Christ is the embodiment, the flesh, the word that became flesh, mm-hmm. I think that is true on a different level as well. Mm-hmm. Every time when I'm in Sri Lanka, and I try to avoid this place, But sometimes I was invited over to give readings and lectures and talks in Sri Lanka. I do believe that I do look like someone one might call a Tamil person. But one, when I'm in Yalpanam, in Jaffna, the city I was born in, everyone confuses me for an American. So mm-hmm. I think there again, you can see the theological truth that mm-hmm. is a physical truth that this language, the German language became my flesh, my mm-hmm. body, and has altered my physique entirely to the point that people from my country, from Mm -hmm. my country, I mean Tamil Ilam, not Sri Lanka, Mm -hmm. people from my people do not recognize me again. So Mm -hmm. return means returning as someone else, as a stranger, and that is the miracle. Mm -hmm. How does that, you know, that that, um, that sense of misrecognition amongst your own your own people, how, how, how does that make you feel when you are not recognized by your own community or your own people? My family and I, we, um, we grew up in, in rural Bavaria. Mm-hmm. So there was not, no such thing as a Tamil community. Mm-hmm. There were two Tamil families as well, but mm-hmm. we were not really close to them. So I did not grow up with a sense of community. Mm-hmm. I did not grow up with um, this form of belonging. But in early age on, I also felt like I didn't need that. I never felt like someone who has to rely on a community. That itself gave me maybe um, the strength and also the courage to pursue a different path than the path that my community or my parents would have chosen for me. Of course, my mom wanted me to become a doctor. Of course, my dad would have preferred me becoming a lawyer or an engineer, but I've become something that Mm -hmm. they never could imagine I would have become. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you, I was wondering, you know, if you you said that you started studying philosophy and you became, a writer by accident. I was wondering if you thought a bit more about how you became a writer, or what what an accident, what an accident was, or how how you experienced that accident. Honestly, and uh, that is the um, uh, situation I'm always in when I'm speaking about about writing. I do not know if I can actually tell you what writing means. Mm-hmm. I can give you second guesses. Mm-hmm. I can give you uh, uh, information about how writing is and will remain a riddle and an enigma to me, but I have not understood yet what writing means. Mm-hmm. There was different seven, seven years ago when I started writing my first book. I mm-hmm. thought I had it all figured out, but mm-hmm. the older I get and the more I write, the less I do understand. Mm-hmm. Thinking back and finding a narrative of why I have become a writer The closest thing I could refer to is uh, my mother. Mm -hmm. My mother is a poet herself. Mm -hmm. My mother started writing poetry when we were living in social housing Mm -hmm. um, back in the um, late 80s and early 90s. And my mother was like any other working class mom working double shifts. Mm -hmm. After those shifts, after work, she came back home. She uh, cooked us dinner. She helped us. with our homeworks in a language to this day she barely speaks. Mm -hmm. And then after she put us to bed, she started writing. And I can vividly remember when I woke up due to thirst in the night and I wanted to get water from the kitchen sink that I saw a shadow lying on the couch, Mm -hmm. exhausted and tired. And that was my mother after writing. My mom sometimes likes to believe that I have become a writer 
a novelist because she's a writer herself. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I kind of like the idea that it gives her comfort. I don't know if it's true, but um, I do think that we have similar, similar approaches to writing. For instance, regarding the time of writing. She wrote due to the very fact that she has worked double shifts and that she had to feed three kids mm -hmm. only in the night. And the night also to me is the time for writing because the night, um, I think I owe something to the night and the night owns me. Mm -hmm. And that is the legacy of my mother. Mm -hmm. That's a very um, beautiful way of imagining how you hate to become a writer or what writing means to you. You know, I just, you know, so I know you, 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 you eat writing and I know you, you work with students of writing. I was wondering how, how you feel about teaching writing. You know, you say, if you ask, me what light it is, you wouldn't know what that, how to explain what light it is. So I was wondering how you, how you approach students of light in. You know, what does it mean to each light in? Then you yourself are trying to figure it out as you, as you move, move, with, move forward with it. Absolutely. I do teach writing uh, at uh, universities here in Germany. I have given lectures at uh, different universities abroad. I'm also teaching writing in grammar schools, mm -hmm. in high schools. Mm -hmm. And I'm also giving different courses for um, uh, individuals. So when I'm actually teaching writing, I begin with saying and making it very clear that one cannot learn how to write. But what we can do is we can learn how to read properly. We can learn a particular sensitivity towards language that enables us to perceive language in a different way. And that might, if our hands will allow that, mm -hmm. that might allow us to write. So I think the approach I am pursuing in teaching in my lectures is that the crucial beginning of writing is reading. And there again, you can see how my Christian upbringing has influenced me. Mm -hmm. It is the holy scripture. It is the holiness of what has been written. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it is the humility we mm -hmm. feel when we are facing a text. Mm -hmm. So then you, then, you, then, you, then you talk about writing, or then you teach writing, or then you talk to students about writing. Do you have a sense of what form looks like or what form is for you? How do you understand form, for example, or literary form? I know that's a, a kind of a broad question or a very large question, but I was wondering if you had anything any, any, any to say about the formal ways of thinking about writing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So regarding the things I've said before, you know, what does it mean to be a racialized writer in mm -hmm. modern day Germany? What does it mean to have brown, dark skin in an entirely white world that I'm living in? What does that mean to me as a writer and a human being and how does that influence my writing? So when we think about forms, a lot of people rely on the forms that have been canonically already established. That is for instance, the traditional novel, that is, for instance, the traditional form of short stories or a novella. I think it is interesting and sometimes saddening to see that a lot of young people, especially racialized writers, are actually relying on the forms of our oppressors. Mm -hmm. And I do think if we want to write differently, if we want to write in a critical, engaging way with the canonical texts of literature and our politics and the society we're living in, then we as racialized writers, we as writers of a certain minority mm -hmm. cannot rely on the very few forms the our oppressors have given to us. So writing to me means we have, if you want to tell something new, something different, mm -hmm. this is not a question of topic. It is a question also of form. If a lot of 
young racialized writers are writing about their life as racialized people in a white society, but using the forms of our oppressor, then they have catered to a white audience, mm -hmm. then their literature is basically a form of betrayal. Mm -hmm. So what I'm encouraging to is for young writers to find different forms, to break the forms of our oppressors, because we cannot articulate our experiences in a canonical, a canonical form of literature that was made to annihilate what we have yeah. seen, that is made <laughs> to silence our voice, that is made to render us invisible. So writing means having the courage to break those forms. Or as Audre Lorde said, you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tool. Mm -hmm. You have to find different weapons. And literature itself, language itself, form itself has to be a weapon. We yeah. can't rely on these forms already established that makes it easier for the audience, that makes our experiences accessible for them when our experiences have always been a riddle and enigma for them. So yeah. we should rely on that enigma. We should rely on that riddle. And I do believe a wound itself is the only enigma that we as writers are writing about mm -hmm. and writing from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, uh, I'm not asking that it's not in the form. You know, being a racialized writer in in uh, in the West, in in Europe, in in Germany, in France, in in Canada, you're often um, told that you have only certain narratives that you have access to. Um, you have only certain narratives that you're supposed to tell. Um, you know, white writers. At least from my experience, don't often get told what stories that they're, they're supposed to say or what stories they're supposed to write about. Mm -hmm. They can write about anything and everything. They can write about philosophy. They can write about theology. They can write about, you know, they can write psychological novels. Um, but as racialized writers, we are often told to really kind of play up our identity because that is the only way our stories will be consumed or, or read or listened to. And so I, you know, I find that so limiting as a, as a writer and as an editor that always having to, you know, really kind of limit how I narrate myself. And I was wondering how you navigate that yourself, or how you think about that yourself, yourself, and how you support students of writing in, in that, you know, especially racialized students, mm -hmm. who are often probably told by publishers and, you know, editors about what kinds of stories they're allowed to talk, say or narrate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right that um, one could say that our identities, but not only our identities, how white people do perceive our identities, that means how they want us to be, is the only currency in any art business, in any art industry. That too is the case in the literary business. Just regarding the structures, the publishing of publishing houses, of agencies, everyone is white. This hasn't changed here in Germany at all. So if they are interested in a text, they are mostly interested because this text is basically identical to how they perceive these people are talking and how these people, they may mostly have never met in their life because they're surrounded only by white people, how these people are leading their lives. So basically it is this form of racial bias that is also constructing the, their notion of our identity. Mm -hmm. I'm honestly, if I can be uh, um, honest with you, I'm really not interested in questions of identity. I, I do think our current discourse is in a lot of ways limited, limiting, self-limiting when we think about who we are and what we are made of. And uh, I think the categories, the terms we're referring to in order to describe who and what we are are mostly false because they are political 
categories, but not aesthetical categories. And we're talking now about writing. Of course, there's a certain space where the political and the aesthetical are touching, where mm -hmm. they are identical, but yet the aesthetical and the politi political is not identical. There's a different form of, one could say, resistance and resilience that we can articulate only in art, only in literature, but not in, um, in the realm of politics. Mm -hmm. So when I first started writing my first book, and maybe I can give you a, a, a brief synopsis of uh, the, the content uh, of the book, um, it is about also about uh, what it means to have uh, been growing up and living in Germany as, uh, as, a, as a Tamil person mm -hmm. or as someone who has fled. That is basically on the surface, one could say the topic, but I was never interested in that. I was more interested in the relationship of language and death. And my first book is basically, one could say a philosophical um, endeavor or an analysis on how language and death have always been intertwined and intimately um, connected in my life. What does it mean? Speaking Tamil in Sri Lanka during the war could literally mean that people are going to kill you, that they're going to set you on fire, they're going to chop you in pieces with their machetes, they're going to rape you, they're going to shoot you right in the face. So the so-called mother tongue was always um, closely tied to death. But yet again, death was the very reason why my family had to flee Sri Lanka. So death is the only reason why I'm able to speak German when I'm writing in German. So what I was trying to find out is how present is death in my language? Mm -hmm. Is death speaking in that particular language or is it me? who's speaking, or is me and death identical? Or am I always speaking towards death because someone else has, has died instead of us? Mm -hmm. So I think when we speak about how can we not only break forms, but also the ideas of, um, and the notions of how white people want to perceive us, mm -hmm. then I think only a radical, um, but also informed literature that knows the canon intimately, but yet knows how to break it. It's the only sincere way how to write without catering to a white audience, without betraying our bodies, our language, and if I might say that, our people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you separate the political from the aesthetic? How do you imagine that in your own writing? Yeah, I'm curious about that. This is a very tricky question because I can only speak in the vagueness of philosophical terms about this particular realm I was talking about where the aesthetic and the political, where poetics and the uh, politics, where aesthetic and ethics are identical. But it is very hard to point fingers and to say where the, do those lines actually begin and where do they end? Because as a dark-skinned person, writing mm -hmm. itself is political. If I want it or not, yeah. Yeah. speaking for yourself is a political act. Yeah. If I want it or not, no matter what I'm talking about, the, tip, the topic is not relevant. Mm -hmm. I can speak about, let's say, cooking in public, mm -hmm. and it could be, and it would be, because I'm speaking as a brown-skinned person in public, a political act. Which kind of political act? That is a different question. If I speak about what was my uh, area of interest uh, while I was studying philosophy, classical German philosophy, as someone who this philosophy wanted to annihilate mm -hmm. by writing, by the terminology, by the categories, by the theories, it is a political act, no matter what I'm writing about, no matter how I'm speaking about it. Mm -hmm. So I think it is very hard to draw the lines Mm -hmm. But yet I do believe that, um, for instance, my second novel is whole, it is a different, um, it is a different angle. My first novel um, was um, um, published in 2016, mm -hmm. while a time in Germany, a lot of refugees, especially from Syria, mm -hmm. came to that country. So this was not an aesthetical question why this novel was successful. It was the political interest of journalists 
that made this book interesting for them and that also allowed this book to reach a wider German audience because the question and the lives of refugees was a political topic back in the days and it is still and it has always been. But for white people, they believed that, oh, all of a sudden, there are a lot of different people coming into this country, you mm -hmm. know, because their lives are different from our lives. Mm -hmm. They have not seen what we have seen. And sometimes I do believe that not only, not even we have seen what we have seen. So mm -hmm. I think, for instance, when I'm thinking about my second novel, which um, is um, not easily translatable into a political discourse, you know, I think that too is a political approach to writing. Ref um, by, um, by um, hold on, I have to uh, think what the word is, by refusing, you know, yeah. the um, imagination <laughs> and the expectation of a white audience. I can see that when I'm uh, thinking about uh, a lot of colleagues that um, their books are closely tied to the first book and they have every right to do so, you know, but, but I wanted to find a different angle, mm -hmm. you know, and I do believe and I hope that this will allow me to also step further into different topics that um, allow me to write and to think through language differently. And I think this approach to literature, that writing to me is a reflection on language, mm -hmm. is what is crucial and where my um, philosophical background comes in play. Mm -hmm. Speaking of your, your background, you, you have a background in philosophy. Um, you also have a background in theology. And I was wondering how theology informs your writing and how much of your writing is a theological exercise. Um, I, 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 like, I like the way you put it, that writing is a theological exercise, and I do believe that is true in every form possible. So let me um, refer to uh, my upbringing and how I learned German again. When I was a kid, I did not know that the Bible was a translation. Mm -hmm. I did believe, and I believed firmly, that mm -hmm. German was the language of God, mm -hmm. that Abraham, Moses, that Jesus and his disciples, that they were speaking German. Mm -hmm. So as a kid, I, I wanted God's words to become my words. Mm -hmm. I wanted God to inhibit not only my mouth, but my entire body. Mm -hmm. I wanted to become his word and my flesh should have become only his word and his word only. So when I think about... Um, the way I'm writing now, you know, for instance, to me, the Bible now, um, besides the question of faith, is a collection of different stories, you know, a story of, of stories that are also very close to fiction, that mm -hmm. are questions of transformation, you know, when Jesus is, for instance, transforming water into wine, you know, when Moses is splitting the Red Sea, you know, and I think that all those stories, the collection of stories that is the Bible, the gospel, the Old Testament, they have shaped my imagination, you know, mm -hmm. and how language can also shape my imagination. Mm -hmm. As a kid, as, I, as soon as I wrote, uh, read that Jesus was able to walk upon water, I could imagine human beings, Jesus walking on water. So there you can see basically how the Bible has shaped my uh, width of imagination, the order of my symbols. And I think that this too allows me to find a different intimate approach that is a religious approach while writing. Mm -hmm. And we're living in a secular society. That is mm -hmm. mostly the case. So sometimes when I speak about theology and religion, and sometimes when, I, uh, when I'm weak and uh, feel like I'm able to talk about my faith, I, I feel like a dinosaur you know, because there are no writers in my age in contemporary German literature that still believe that the Bible is a, um, a, a source that is still full of potential mm -hmm. and that is still relevant to mm -hmm. my writing 
and I'd also say to my life uh, at this to this day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Bible is a, a very very rich source of mythology and, and storytelling, and it had there's a lot of ways in which it can it provides a kind of template for for life and how to think about life. And so it, you know, it's very interesting how we thought about sort of how theology sort of has become a way in which you think about your writing. I would say, you know, when we were, when we, when we're speaking about the Bible, that the Bible itself is a poetic, you know? In the yes. beginning, there was the word, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you know? <laughs> so it is a reflection on language in itself. For sure. You know? So I think uh, regarding this very fact that there was no alternative for me mm-hmm. than to still refer and uh, still being drawn to the Bible. So you mentioned that uh, uh, a little while before, you mentioned that you wanted to become a pastor. And I was wondering what made you decide not to become a pastor or, or move away from that, that path. I think it was, um, if I can be honest with you, uh, my lack of faith, mm-hmm. you know, that it did not feel sincere to uh, um, talk about God's word if mm-hmm. I don't believe in God's word uh, in a way I'd like to believe in it. And mm-hmm. in a similar way, I don't believe in literature, you mm-hmm. know, and uh, I don't have the uh, faith in literature mm-hmm. uh, as most of my colleagues do have, you mm-hmm. know. I don't know what literature can change, you know, but yet I am writing. And Mm -hmm. as I said before, I don't know why I'm writing, but to me, the most important fact is that I am writing, that Mm -hmm. my hands have mastered me. And sometimes I feel like there's this mystery of writing that that is still very present to me. For instance, I don't know where all these words are coming from. And when I'm writing, it feels like I'm a bystander. I'm just Mm -hmm. a spectator. I'm just a witness and all of a sudden the words are lining Mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if I was the one who actually wrote that and maybe it was trauma and maybe it was God and maybe God and trauma is the same Mm -hmm. and maybe they both were writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I know it's it's interesting that you say that part of trauma maybe the same that's a so I had never thought about that in, in those words, but I think that's something to definitely think about. You know, if I, if I, if I can yeah. add something, Ricky, you know, yeah. in psychoanalysis, mm-hmm. because Freud was interested in archaeology, yes, Freud yeah. believed that the past is hidden down, mm-hmm. down there, you know, like Dante imagined, for instance, hell, you know, yeah. the nine circles of hell. Mm-hmm. Freud loved archaeology. A- anyone who has seen pictures of his office, you know, and all the references to archaeology, all the archaeological artifacts he, he owned, mm-hmm. one can see that he believed in digging. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. but, I, but I sometimes think, uh, in contrast uh, and contradicting Freud, that we don't only suppress downwards, we also supp- suppress upwards, to the left, to the right, and in, di- in different ways, you know? There's not just one direction for suppression. No. I and mean, it, it depends on what, 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 what you are suppressing for and what, the, what, the, what, what, what aspect of the past you are suppressing. You know, it's, it, one, you know I have I guess a, a, one more question before, you know, we open up the floor for, um, Q&A questions. Um, you said, you, you mentioned that you don't know why you write. I was wondering if I could push you <laughs> to ask yourself that question. You know, I, I'm curious, like, do you ever ask yourself why you write? Oh, I'm asking myself constantly, every day, every and minute, what, every what second. Are the, what are some of, the, some of the thoughts that come to your mind? I'm, I'm curious about that. Yeah. I really don't know. 
it is very um, odd for me that I'm writing because <laughs> sometimes, you know, um, I'd like to uh, 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 live in a hidden place, but yet I'm exposing myself with the most intimate experiences, with my most intimate language. Mm -hmm. I'm exposing myself to a public. Mm -hmm. I am offering what I have written without yeah. knowing who I'm offering it to. Mm -hmm. I'm addressing no one by writing, but yet language itself is addressing itself towards someone. Language mm -hmm. is always directed to someone. It is made to be read. I don't know why I'm writing, mm -hmm. and I have not... Um, uh, I have not understand why I have written in the first place, but yeah. you know, sometimes I believe some mysteries should remain mysteries and some riddles and some enigmas can remain enigmas. But I can tell you that as soon as I will find out why I'm writing, I will quit writing instantly. <laughs>